Before we start today's episode, a bit of housekeeping for all those listeners out there. Whichever your podcast listening platform of choice, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts or Spotify, reviews can make a huge difference. Not only do we value your feedback, which can help us create better content, but it will also help others discover the podcast. So spread the love and leave a review if you've got a minute. And with that, on with today's show. I'm the Reverend Dr. Jenny McKay, veterinarian and minister in secular employment, environmentalist, activist and self-confessed cat junkie. But believe it or not, I have never met Cheap as Chips Charlie, Jabber, Rather Large Dave or the Red Baron. But someone who has is my guest today, Colin Dobson, a.k.a. at the Abingdon Taxi. So hello, Colin. Thank you so much for chatting with us today. Hi, Jenny. No problem. Would you like to tell these listeners who don't follow your brilliant Twitter page about this yeah. unique yeah. cast of characters? So they, yeah, there's quite a lot of characters, really. So they are characters um, in a small town, Abingdon, which is uh, seven miles from where I live in Oxford, which is mostly Abingdon is where I work. Um, it, it's kind of, it's a funny old town, really. It's um, uh, probably about 10 odd. It's had better days. And, you know, its glory days were really before the... Um, dissolution of the monasteries, um, and it doesn't have any kind of large. It's an old place to to be, you know, to be um, to be a taxi driver. <laughs> um, um, but I, I ended up becoming a taxi driver there by 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 accident, by a sort of accident of geography, really. And um, these characters are people that I have met and I've interacted with. Some of them are my passengers. Um, that they are people that I've I've known over a period of oh gosh I've been licensed for seventeen years I've been flying for hire for probably about fifteen years something something like that and I used to do night shifts ten years oh. of of the prime of my life it's really boring Jenny it's really uh, really really boring <laughs> um it, it's really boring. For half the time, so um, so for example, I would, I would leave my house at um, six o'clock on a Friday evening. I'd drive over to Abingdon. I'd join the taxi rank, and I'd wait for people to come to me. I might have booked jobs in in between, um, and you know the taxi rank is grossly oversubscribed. Grossly yes. oversubscribed. Um, far too many licences issued for for five. Um, by places on the rank and um you know you would take more than an hour to get from the back oh, of the queue goodness. from and it, it's just like I, I don't want to say it's soul destroying because it's not but it, it it does do something to your soul um working through the night and seeing people's behavior so i i just really started um started writing about um writing about them uh, obviously i don't use any real names except with their permission um so it's the hence this uh, this this custom character <laughs> really. so what do you think it was about peeking behind the curtain of the life of a taxi driver that first caught people's imagination um well I, t I can tell you exactly what it was actually I, i'm quite friend because i write about a lot of very localized things so i'm friends with a lot of uh journalists mm -hmm. um a lot of local journalists um twitter is a big um is a big kind of source for them um, um and uh, so i write a lot of hyper local stuff i'm very concerned with oh just interested in kind of why things are done the way they are locally so for example the taxi rank that's on the wrong side of the road and yes, how that can yes. um, um uh i'm followed and have driven a lot of ex mayors of abingdon um the local member of parliament was in my taxi at one point okay. um also a cat lover, um, <laughs> um, and um, the leader of the county council, all these kind of people that yes. have got influence and power mm -hmm. locally, just because we're interested in similar issues. And um, it, it was uh, a very lovely guy once wrote an article about me. It's still on the BBC website now. It's about 12 years ago. Um, and he, um, this is music, is another big interest of mine. And so he's he writes about music. 
he writes about other things as well, but he writes about all the bands that you can see around uh, around Oxfordshire, which is which is there's a big local music scene, uh, especially in Oxford. And um, he said, oh, "I'm I'm going to write about this." And so so he wrote the article on the BBC website, and this was back in the days when you know people had sort of like a few hundred followers, and then my number of followers kind of went from about. Uh, 500 to around 2000 overnight oh, just wow. because he, and they all the, these people all started following me because of the article that was on that was on, written that's tremendous isn't it yeah so that yeah. that was a real starting point for you but that's common now for people to have mm-hmm. you know 3000 or 4000 or 5 yes change. Yes. I mean, it's not even called twitter anymore no uh, no no i keep calling it twitter but yeah <laughs> I do. X, yeah, I do. X. And I think sometimes I've always felt if I've done something or I've done a little radio broadcast or something's been very popular online, that, mm-hmm. oh, that's going to make me really famous. But it's real. It's really, really hard work, isn't it? Because as you say, there's so much stuff coming out these days that, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, it's kind of, it's over in an instant, isn't it? It may be a really, really yeah. big thing for that person. But yeah. there's so many other yeah. things going on. So. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, it's changed as a as a sort of um it, its kind of structure and its its business model and all of that. And um it's it's actually it's act it was in the old days it was a good way of contacting people like yourself, um, although I've only known you for a short time, but people like yourself who have similar interests. So, you know, mm. church, cats, um, taxi drivers. Um, it was good in those days, but now it seems to be more kind of um, problematic, uh, fractious, um, yes. argumentative. I mean, I, I in the old days, I would just be following people that had similar kind of mm. um, Mm-hmm. Interesting. Now I get fed stuff that I just don't. Want yeah, to really yeah, and st- people just yeah come across and make horrible comments, probably. <laughs> yeah, because that's what, make, oh, that's what drives up the number of people that look at their advertisements and look at their look at their platform. And um, so, so it's kind of it's kind of changed a bit for me, but I still keep the platform because you know there are there are shed loads of people on there that I've met. I mean, I, I said the other day. Um, I've met oh well over a hundred people in the real world that I first met online on Twitter that I would never have um, ne- never have come across um, otherwise, and and those people have enriched my life enormously. So you know, there's there's the unpleasant people, but then there are the people that are, are life enhancing, um, and for sure, those people completely outweigh the the unpleasantness, despite all the stuff that used to happen at night time. Absolutely. Must must keep persevering, and I'm sure you will. I'm not going to move on to talking about the the pandemic because I'm sure, like many of us, that totally totally changed your life. So, what was a big change for you, and how did this lead to your new calling as a parish administration manager at your local church? That's a great question. Um... It obviously changed things completely. Um, so I basically, in order to earn a living before, um, I would have to go out at, say, like, say, about six o'clock, and I would still be driving 12 hours later, six hours driving, six hours waiting around for work. Um, at, the, at the time of the pandemic, um, taxi drivers were one of the, um, so I was full time on it at that point, taxi drivers were one of the groups of people, professions that were still allowed to continue working. However, there was no work <laughs> because the, the people were were not traveling during the lockdown. Um, and, I, and I, during the first lockdown, I'd say that was almost universally uh, observed because I, I was doing occasional work like, um, so I would take orders from people who didn't want to go out and I do a bit of shopping for them. Um, and you know, do you remember the toilet roll shortages and the <laughs> the bread shortages because everybody oh, was making that's right. flour at home? So I, I had um, the, near to where I live. It's closed now, sadly. Um, there was this wonderful place which was the Wessex Flour Mill, um, and they are based in Wantage in the Vale of Whitehorse, and. Um, they 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 sell you this flour that's been grown. Um, the wheat has been grown in Wallingford. So they tell you the name of the farm and the farmer, and they were a source of flour during the um, mm-hmm. during the pandemic. So, and but there was only one day a week on that, um, oh. and 
so there was no work and there was no money and it was extremely stressful i we all deal with things differently but i describe it as worse than the bereavement uh, in terms of the amount mm. of um in terms of the amount of stress that there was uh at that time um i, I live on my own um i haven't got had didn't have anyone else to to help me at the start of it um a bit like ladies from church were the first to help um they they were putting anonymous food parcels on my doorstep um uh, if it wasn't for them and if it wasn't um you know some people outside the church would I have survived? Yes, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but if it wasn't for them, then uh, and the random acts of kindness from some of the people that, um, in fact, some that I still haven't met in the real world to this day, who knew mm-hmm. me online and knew the, what I sort of stand for, really, if it wasn't for them, um, uh, it would have been a complete disaster, Jenny. I would have probably had a, a, you know, I don't know, like a nervous breakdown or a mental health crisis or something. Um, they, they kind of don't want to say they saved me, um, but materially they did. Absolutely. They did. Yeah. They did. Yeah. So that was that was a great connection to them. And then you felt that you wanted to do more yeah. for that church, I guess. Yeah. So that so that opportunity so it's a really odd role, you know, uh, and you will know this as well as anybody. Um it's a really odd role because um uh, <sighs> They do say that you should not appoint an operations manager um, unless you also have an administrator, um, because the operations manager will um, will end up basically the the, the admin will take up his or her time, um, and so, so the church advertised this role um, as an operations manager initially, and um, I didn't apply for it at that stage. They re-advertised the role. They call it parish administration manager, right? Yeah. So it's not. It's not purely administration. It has the, the word manager basically means that mm-hmm. um, certain things are delegated in terms of sort of day to day sort of decision making. Right. It, it was described by a church consultant that we have in had in as a sort of executive church warden that kind of um, uh, okay that kind of role. So I do lots of fabric. I do uh, I do kind of um, liaison with tradespeople in the church building. Um, this 200 year old building um, and, um, and I do kind of like um, the big issue with uh, reverberation in the church um, is caused by the removal of the church organ in 2000 oh. that was in the pandemic as well um, so the sound bounces around the church and when you're preaching right, right. Um, it makes it very hard for a person who's sat at the back of the church to be able to hear it. Uh-huh. Um, and it's really important for me. I'm quite into these kind of practical things that, you know, if people come to church for the first time and they can't hear what's going on, they're unlikely to come back. So so we've had to mitigate that with all sorts of interesting things like um, uh, kind of new sound desk, um, additional speakers in the church. There is a project um, that may or may not come to fruition, mostly to do with, you know, DAC and faculties and all that stuff. So oh, yes. just... I know. Anything that changes, you have to go through yeah. this awful process. You have process. to do that system. And, that's, um, and that is uh, basically the, the addition of a number of acoustic panels in the church to absorb the sound. Um, right. there's, only, there's only one church in the whole diocese, and it's a massive diocese covering mm-hmm. actually five counties, but three main Gosh. ones, Buck, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire. There's only one other church in the entire diocese I know that's done it. Um, and I think it's a really effective um, and a great example. But, but, but it's a thing that takes a long, long time. So there's day-to-day admin and there are longer-term sort of um, longer-term projects um, like that that I, I try to sort of carry forward and and um, present to the decision makers and um, wow, that's um, great. I think I think we need you in our church as well. Yeah, yeah. because you need that, don't you? You need the long term yeah. um, vision yeah. for, for yeah. the church, which yeah, is absolutely. very very important. Yeah. So, so I suppose I would say really the role is to take some of the pressure off the incumbent, off the rector. Um, uh, so that he does not, or she, as it was previously, um, d- does not have to be so concerned with day-to-day kind of um, admin and operational manager. They can do what, what they are. They can fulfill their kind of calling and their vocation um, to preach and to be a pastor. Um, and 
Um, and it's a great job, Jenny. You know, that's marvelous. Really, that's marvelous. And do you do that every day, or just I do it four days, days a week? Four so, days a week. So I do. I do thirty-two hours for the church, okay. uh, and I'm still ta- I'm still taxi driving. So um, yeah. So it's cool. I mean, I need to do. I need. To, I need the job. I'm not financially. Um, what's the word? Uh, independent, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, so I need to work. Um, but partly because of you know the, the massive kind of. Um, um, loss of income that happened during the course of yes. the pandemic. I mean, we're talking something in the order of forty to forty five thousand, just just um, thirty thousand pounds of work disappeared overnight yes. when the yes. when the lockdown started, and and you know here we still are all these years later, <laughs> still dealing with the after effects um, um, of it. So it's a great role, you know. It's it's a it's a good thing that's come out of a very mm-hmm really dreadful time um uh, and um it's a great role because there's a lot of variety and there's a lot of meeting with people um and there's there different kind of um different tasks it's not the same job every day and they're nope. different location as well because we we have other um we have other buildings apart from the the church building mm-hmm. so yeah and do you do you live stream services as well <laughs> Oh my goodness! <laughs> I just was That's listening a... to your wonderful, you know, sound system, yeah. and the, right. the, it's a perfect opportunity, right. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the sound, the sound system is really good. It is a perfect opportunity for that. However, um, I don't know if you know this, but during the pandemic, there was a person who worked at um, Church House in Westminster, who uh, worked for the Church of England, which, which is the Church of England headquarters, whose sole job was to get awkward churches connected to <laughs> broadband. And um, we are, which is church is just over there outside the window um we are a city center church and we cannot get broadband oh. um despite the help of this person who worked at um who worked at, at church house it went to direct level within um the the broadband provider um the the broadband provider at the end of this process of a year and a half um refused to connect us to the nearest fiber box oh. Um, they said we could do what's called a community, um, oh, I can't remember the exact phrase, or community something like, it's basically where the community gets together and we pay, we pay for a new box ourselves. However, there's no way that's going to happen because all of the surrounding properties are already connected to, to the existing box. I know because I've been to look at them um, and, and um you know, there's no way they will contribute towards no, a, a... No, they don't need it. Oh, no. So there's no no it. solution so, to this. So there's, there's no solution. And this, this is an interesting thing about my job with the church because it's um, it's to try and come up with solutions to, yeah, yeah, to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. things like this. Um, um, there's going to be a, quite a big development over the course of the next few years surrounding the church on three sides. So we're in, we're in a water meadow. We're on a raised area and there's water meadow behind the church. Um, there's going to be a development on on that site um, and on the other two sides of the church, um, and that development another box in because of that. And so I'm hoping that finally we can bring the church uh, um, online at that. Yeah, because that was one of the things that came out of the lockdown as well. I mean, for me, I mean, I wouldn't have gone online if it hadn't been for for COVID. Oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Yeah. So yeah, the the whole online ministry started because obviously I work work as a vet and I wanted to remain in touch. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So COVID COVID did have me yeah, bring around some good things, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Are you in the city as well then? Or? Uh my church is in Stockport. So, Stockport, okay. Yeah. So yes, we live stream and then you know, home home is quite a rural environment, but we've got good enough broadband, so I can yep. stream from there yep. as well. Okay. Um, so basically, I I um, so during COVID, obviously we had, we had funerals and weddings as normal, mm-hmm. and they wanted live streams because, as you know, I think it was you were restricted to I think fifteen at a wedding at one point. Yes. Um, and we did do it. So we have all the equipment. Um, it takes two hours to set it up and take it down. And I was I was pushing it. I'm not joking. I was pushing it through hotspotting to my mobile phone <laughs> at four megabytes um, upload speed. And really, you need eight. So it was constantly breaking down. 
um but it's starting back up again and all that kind of stuff but people wanted to be part of the mm. service and you know our, our mate ken um god rest his soul when he passed um we had um nearly 200 people on the live stream yes. Um, and we had about whatever the limit was in church at that point. It may be 15 or 30 or something like that. Uh, and and you're right. It is a real ministry for people. And, you know, they can see your ministers um, online. They think, oh, I quite like that. And I quite like mm-hmm. what this person is preaching about. And I think I could get on with them. And it seems like a friendly church and all those kind of positive mm-hmm. things. And, it's, and I, it's something that I really feel strongly about that we should, you know, we should, we should be doing. We'll eventually find a way, Jenny. You will, <laughs> you will, you must, you must absolutely. Um, I'm never giving up. I'm ne- no, I'm never... and then you know, I think yeah. people also they like the fact that they can watch the service whenever they want. Maybe, yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, obviously not. Never go to the church, but sometimes you might yeah. just want to watch morning prayer, sitting in bed with a cup of coffee. Exactly. Or um, um, so, so we are actually recording sermons. That's what we offer at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, or put it on a podcast. Or so I used to. Okay. I used to listen to sermons again when, when in my other role as a taxi driver, uh, I'll be driving up and down the motorway a lot to Heathrow Airport M40, M4, M25. Um, on the way, but obviously not with a person in the car at the time. Um, I, I put the week's sermon on and I would just find that quite a useful mm-hmm. thing to do on the way back because obviously I'm also working on Sundays, um okay. two or three Sundays out of four, um to keep to keep to keep the the um uh, what do we call it uh, the video presentation. So we 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 have all our lyrics um on screen, mm-hmm. um all our lyrics on screen, the video presentation, the sound desk to keep those um to keep those going because frankly it's pretty hard to 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 um, attract sufficient volunteer kind of um, right. um, capability to keep those uh, to keep those things going. So yeah, so I I, I really value um, being able to listen to the sermon again. Um, yes, and, yes. And I know other people do because they're they're ask, they're asking me for it. So I would love to be in a position where we are actually live streaming the um, you know sound and vision. That's it. Well, We've got all the equipment, but uh, we haven't got the connection. <laughs> it will happen. I'm sure it will. And it will be a great, great benefit to the to the church. Absolutely. So thinking a bit back to your childhood, I believe you felt a resonance even as a child yeah. during school, school assemblies and then to yeah. the place. So, so how did that yeah. journey evolve in becoming a devout Christian in your adult life? Yeah, I, I think I have a problem with the word devout because, uh, and I'm not entirely sure why. I, I'm i totally okay with you describing me in that way. Um, I, I don't know that I would describe myself as devout um, because I've met a shed load of people in my lifetime, including in the taxi. Um, uh, you know, someone gets in the car, it's quite an intimate space. Mm-hmm. Holy people, really holy people, more holy than me. Um, and you instantly know when you're in the presence of a person like that. So, so I think I have a problem with the word devout because I, I feel that I'm not um, not like these various pe- holy people that I, I have met <laughs> during the course of my lifetime. Um, it, it was a Church of England school uh, in the inner city in Oxford um, in the 1970s. There was daily assembly. There was daily hymn singing. Um, we're, we're singing this song, um, you know, We Plough the Fields and Scatter, mm-hmm. it's way our festival favourite. Um, I know all the words, I don't have to <laughs> look at the screen or the books. Um, and there was this weird thing um, in the 70s, there weren't enough hymn books to go around at the school, but if you, this is a weird, was weird practice at the school, but if you learn the words of the ones that they sang most often, so All Things Bright and Beautiful and all the great old, um, great old classics, then you got given a hymn book, right? Uh-huh. But actually the hymn book should have gone to the, to the boys and girls that were struggling to, um, were, that were struggling. Um, but I got given this hymn book. Um, I've still got it to this day um, somewhere at home. And um, I think there is something about the practice of, I still say the Lord's Prayer 
like the old version, trespasses rather mm-hmm. than sins. Mm-hmm. Um, although we use the version sins in church, and I, I find myself okay. using the old words that I was taught way back then. And I think there's something about that, that daily instilling of those practices, which is really very mm-hmm. profound. And it's been with me for the whole of uh, for the whole of my life. Um, I always knew the, the story of um, the, what was done to Jesus um, uh, and his dying and his rising from the dead was um, the most profound thing that's ever happened in the entire history. One, uh, it was, uh, I was twenty-one when it happened. So it was a conversion experience. Um, I, I didn't. I mean, I, I did believe he was the son of God, but I didn't believe in my heart in the sense of that it was possible to, that, you know, Jesus could be your mate, uh, could be your friend, um, and it was possible to have a relationship uh, with him. Uh, so I think that's what has changed at that point. Um, but the instilling of those habits, I mean, I was always respectful. I, I was never the kind of boy that would um, say, oh, this is a load of old rubbish, why do we have to do this? So, um and I understand why some some might think that way. Um, instilled a, a lot of into me, which I can see all. I can see why that happened when I was twenty one because I was already kind of amenable to um, uh, amenable to, to to the story because I always respected him. I don't know. I would say Jesus. I mean, um, I always respected him and his story and what he did in his ministry and but it was just a story um the greatest story ever told but it was just a story um mm-hmm. and until until that point when when mm-hmm. i was um when i was 21 um and so now i'm kind of more than 30 odd years <laughs> um, uh, as a christian at a different point in my life and i you know i've kept the faith for You've all, all of faith. that time i've never it's wonderful never, you haven't wavered um, yeah, I've kept. Well, I guess we've all we've at I've, some I've point, all, haven't we? Yeah. We've all made it. So, so but there was never a time when I didn't believe, um, but there were times when you know, especially as a young man, work becomes the th- work becomes a kind of false idol, really, um, in some respects. And so, oh, I won't go to church on Sunday morning, um, and uh, I won't go to the prayer group on on um, on a Tuesday. Uh, sorry, to the home and group on a Tuesday night, and I won't go to midweek prayers. Um, and those are all things which bring great comfort now in in middle age. You know, comfort and sustenance, and um, and we'll, uh, frankly, you know, physical sustenance as well as spiritual sustenance. Certainly during the, the pandemic, because those yes. those are the people that that were the you know the little old ladies at church who've been Christians their entire lives were the first ones to help in a practical way. Um, and that that kind of sense of community is super important. It is. If you can find that kind of church, yes. it's super important. Yes. Um, especially <laughs> people like me that live on our own. <laughs> well, community is very important, isn't it? Yeah. And I think, you know, people today are more individualistic. Um, yeah. And we are living... You know, we are living in this parish in a, um, a community which is very transitory. It's a university city, as you know. Yes. Um, it's more than 65% um, multi-occupancy. Um, the, the people come, and so it's changed from the being a working-class parish to a slightly gentrified student parish. Mm-hmm. Um, and the students have their own community in their own campus. Um, yes. Um, uh, but, but here's the interesting thing. Um I, I, we have this thing at church. It's, it's sort of like a quasi men's group, although it's not exclusively men. But we so we do jobs in the church on Saturday. Um, I have this habit of leaving the doors of the church wide open, right? So the students are at the top of the hill at um, okay. Brooks University. Okay, so they walk down the hill. The church is at the bottom of the hill. If the doors are open, they will come in, Jenny. You know, they mm-hmm. they will come in. Mm-hmm. We're pottering around, fiddling around, doing our kind of wiring and um, microphones and um, setting up sound gear and all that stuff on the Saturday. So if you open the doors, the people will come in. And, and the students, they come in while they're on the way to the shops in the city centre, okay. you know, or the pub or, or whatever. And they just sit there. And some of them are undoubtedly praying because they've just got that sort of prayerful posture, you can tell. Um, but some of them just want a place to sit mm. where it's quiet. It's not busy and it's not constantly kind of um constantly moving and they, they want that sense of peace you know i i, I kind of just describe it as um you know the peace that passes all understanding as they say and god's peace um and um you know so that's why i, I like running the the um 
even though it's additional work beyond my work hours, I like running the Saturday thing. Um, we don't do it every week. It's an ad hoc basis okay. um, because we open the doors of the church and the people walk in. But but yeah, it's a funny, it's a funny, it's a it's a strange parish in that sense because it's um, the population is extremely transitory. So the sense of community is is really important. Um, so we're probably we're probably about uh, oh I don't know about twenty people who actually live in the parish and the rest come right. from right. come from outside because of what we're about, which is authenticity we love jesus right you know we do love jesus um authenticity and and that kind of sense of friendliness less formal Mm -hmm. not so much we can do formality but Mm -hmm. we're we're less formal than other churches and and more about friendliness and and yes and i did i did find community and i think that's what i was kind of looking for my whole life really um you know know, because i um um I've been the oldest person in my family since I was about 40. Um, I don't have any older members of my family left. And I, okay. I think that's what I was looking for in that place. A nice community. Yeah. I like to say the the students, they, they come and go and it must be wonderful getting yeah. getting to know them. But yeah. it, it, it is transitory. But they take oh, it's, whatever it's, they've lo- learned in the church out to their new communities, don't yeah, they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a bit sad, you know. And I, I mean, I've lost count of the number of times over the years. I mean, I did it most recently. One of our um, uh, postgraduate student um, members had moved um, to Surrey, and you know, off I went to the um, to the Van Hart place, and I had a van, and we loaded up all that stuff. Uh, it's the kind of church where you know people will turn out to actually do stuff in your house. So, for example, during the pandemic, the assistant curate that we had at the time, he, he's like a trainee um, trainee priest. Uh, he 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 did his pastoral visit in my house um, just before the pandemic, before it got closed um, down, and he, and he helped me paint my ceiling, you know. Um, <laughs> there was a, whilst he was doing the pastoral visits um, and conversation. Okay, okay. Um, so you've got a lasting memory of him. <laughs> Yeah, and then there was another time when all the people from the home group, um, I, I, I was renting this garage, um, which had a, a sort of um, uh, accretion of kind of stuff from various relatives' houses as they'd all died off, and it just went into the garage. And so they all turned up, um, and they helped me clear out this garage and um, get rid of a load of old junk. Um, so it's that. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's not just. Uh, it's one of my big sayings. You yes. know, Jesus. Yes. Jesus is not just for Sundays. Um, yeah. You know, the people in the church will, it's a wonderful, wonderful place, and they will come and they will help you. They will clear your garden and all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff um, that that happens, you know. Um, since it's not, it's not just let's go to church on Sundays and that's it. It's it's the rest of the week as well. Yeah. That is wonderful. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, it is a wonderful place. I'll have to come and visit. <laughs> Sounds you great. Should. Yeah, you should. so i'm going to shift topic slightly on to cats because we are both cat lovers yeah and i know you you, i know they're wonderful animals and you're a great believer in cat adoption and of course you lost your beautiful cat early in the year which must have been very very traumatic yeah Um, it was yeah. yeah, yeah, he he was only with me for thirty two days, Jenny. Um, so his name was Colin as well. That's mm. that's why basically why I adopted him because I, I saw him on the uh, on the cat protection website and uh, and I thought, oh, um, five cats in two years. But my two previous cats, Harry and Katie, who I, I tweet about a lot. Yeah. Uh, um, and I also tweet was as I'm, as I'm driving around when I was driving as a taxi driver about other cats that I meet and and I photograph them and and um, you know and I, I, I get great kind of comfort from that. Um, so Harry was twenty. Well, the vet, right? Well, you you would know this, of course, but the vet, vet uh, this vet was a wonderful person because she used to, oh, so I went to to her with Harry thinking he was ten years old. Oh, um, right. Um, and she said, well, you do realise, don't you, that he's like 21 or 22. And he, he was judged to be on his last legs at that point. Oh. And then he lived for another two to three years after Even that. Um, so, and then Katie, she was younger. She died um, the next year. 
And it was a long time before I felt able to give a home mm. to Colin, who it turned out, and he lasted for 32 days. Oh, was, no, one extreme to the it, other. It, it, one extreme to the other. Um, and I just don't understand why people will put cats out onto the street when there are there are shed loads of charities in this county of Oxfordshire. There are at least 11 charities, including all the big ones as well as smaller ones, who yes. will take the cats in. They won't ask any questions. You know, yeah. they don't judge people. They just want to give them a home. And they won't, They you know, they won't... Um, they never, they never uh, sort of um, uh, put down a, a, a healthy cat, as it were. Um, uh, and... And I don't understand why people do that. And I have a, a, a heart for, uh, I suppose, a cat who's not had a, a good um, a good treatment from the treatment they deserve um, from 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 humans. And Colin had lived on the streets for oh years and years. Mm-hmm. North Oxfordshire. Apologies for that. But they like to rehome them um, away from their their locality generally, just because okay. um, I guess. Because the cat might try and go back to a previous yes. residence or something. Yes. So, so, so I saw this guy Colin. Uh, went they they keep him in um like a cattery. Um, well, they live quite a nice life actually. It's a really, really, really good, well, well, kind of um, well thought out um cattery, and they have like a little house within the cattery. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went to meet him. Uh, uh, I, I was quite upset because of um. You know, it, it was probably less than a year, I think, since my previous cat had died. Um, and I was quite upset at the time, uh, but I came to the realisation, because uh, I went to see him three times before um, I, I said to them that I, I would be willing to um, to adopt him and give him a home just because I wanted to be sure in myself that yes. I was doing the right thing. Yes. Um, and, um, yeah, he... he, he I, I think he, I didn't ask for a post mortem because what's the point after they've died? But I, I uh, this is going to sound very silly to you, but mm. I'm just going to say it anyway. This is it's a true thing. Um, I drove this guy to Gatwick Airport. Um, sorry, I picked him up from Gatwick Airport in my taxi. I came back. I dropped him off at nine o'clock, and, and I felt a what I call it a change in the force. Right, so it's like a sort of um, it's like a sort of Star Wars reference, really. Mm-hmm. And I knew that something had happened to him at that point. Um, then I got home and I found him um, oh. dead on the carpet. He, he had a very really swollen stomach. Um, I'm pretty sure he had some form of undiagnosed. Um, stomach uh stomach Sorry, condition yeah, um, yeah but he was he was the most i mean he knew instantly he was in the right place <laughs> you know he was under the bed for three hours and he came out and he's very affectionate uh, very loving um just a really lovely boy um and i thought oh you know he's gonna be around for 10 minutes yeah hi sad long lifespan and, and and so yeah that was that was Colin in 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 um in uh, February March and um it just was it, sorry April May. a special a special cat <laughs> yeah he was yeah yeah he was there was a bond so I mean so, sometimes you know you meet a cat and there's an instant bond and um I, I mean I do always say it's a cliche but I do always say that they choose their humans and <laughs> um he did um but you see, my present cats are completely different. <laughs> uh, completely different. But you do have a good bond with Prospero. <laughs> with Prospero, yeah. So Julia is still, she's named after Julian of Norwich, who had a cat. Uh, and basically, the, the first female um, um, uh, also, as it were, um, of a work of literature in the English language. That's why I named her after that. But So their brother and sister... Um, they, their story, they're black and white. Their story is that they were going to be transferred. Is that the right phrase? From one tenant to another in a property. So the yes. tenants moved out um, in a very well-off area of Oxfordshire. Very well-off. So this is not the kind of thing that you would expect um, in that locality. You might expect it in a less well-off area, maybe because they don't have much money, but you wouldn't expect it there. Um, and so in the time between, so the new tenants were going to take them on, um, I've renamed them, which I've done for the first time in my life because I didn't much like their previous <laughs> name. I didn't, I didn't think their previous name suited them at all. 
Um, and I've never renamed a cat before an adoption. I've always kept the existing names, um, but I did do it this time. Um, and so they put them, basically the tenant, the the landlord came in to do the inspection of the property in between tenants, and the landlord um, put these two cats out onto the streets, and they were on the streets. I think, I don't actually know how long. Uh, I think it was less than a year, but they were fending for themselves. Um, but because they, because they had originally been um adopted from the uh, from the cats charity yeah. uh, therefore they, they had i think they must have traced them via the microchip they probably uh, would yes yes yeah. that would be um, it. But, but because they had done that obviously they knew their um you know they knew where they came from and they knew their they knew their they knew their story but um um but yeah so that was three i don't know sorry that was um just over a month ago so I came home from, they actually asked me about this at home group the other night, at, at the church home group. And um, she'd been under the bed, under the sofa, sorry, for a month. Um, and he was he was out after about two weeks. And she, so I, I have no relationship with Julia at the moment. <laughs> um, but I do have one with him. <laughs> um, I'm not concerned, Jenny, because um, I think I've said to you on Twitter, um, I have... Um, I have one of those. Do you know those cat feeders you can get that chuck out the food? Oh yes, yes. Yeah. And on the on the cat feeder there is a, there's a camera. So every time when I can see my phone, <laughs> just, just told me now. I can see now on my phone that she is she is at the cat feeder. Right? That's so, good. So, she's also, she's still alive. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. No, and she, she will she will come right. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not concerned because you know the the cat feeder and the water fountain both notify me when one of the cats has had a drink and I can <laughs> see her moving around the house on the camera um, and obviously the litter tray and all that normal so I'm not concerned that I think it will happen eventually but yes. she did come out for the first time um, and she plays with her brother during the night as well yeah. you know they play together um, and she did come out on Tuesday night for the first time they'd asked me about her at home group and i went home and there she was and she didn't run away when i came oh indoors. it's sometimes <laughs> slow yeah i mean you don't know what's happened to them do you or what I, what, trauma I, they've I, had. I what kind of treatment they've had and they may have had you know bad treatment from a man or or or, or something yes it could be nothing really you don't know um, my, my friend the other side of the uh other main road there she um she adopted cats as well um, and her cats were three and a half months before they came out of um, came out of hiding. So it takes as long as it takes. You it know, does. I think. It does. You just need to have uh, some patience, which you will yeah. have, a lot, have a lot of anyway in your in your role as taxi driver as well. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a virtue. Yeah. Oh no, absolutely. I mean, I've been used to. As I said, um, if you're doing it full time and you're working off the rank, half the time is spent waiting. Um, and it, it's like, like and, it, and it, it was hard, you know, because you're waiting for something that may not happen. And, and it's odd, you know, in terms of faith, because I have absolute, um, um, absolute confidence that Jesus is uh, coming to the earth again. Um, and everything's going to be all right at that point. Absolute confidence in that. Because uh, I know that that's going to happen. I don't mind waiting for it, right? But taxi driving, you know, you, you don't know. You, you, you don't, don't know. know where the next um pound is coming from um it goes up and down all the time it's not a reliable um income stream it's not consistent income stream um uh, hence you know another reason for for taking the church job is because it allows a bit more yeah. stability yeah. in 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 my life um yeah, yeah. yeah. but so you're a little but, bit yeah. you're a little bit like me then so you you know You've got the yeah. church, but you've got that presence in the in the yeah. secular world, if you like, yeah. and and you can have a, a huge impact there. I mean, you can't always have theological discussions, can you? But sometimes it will it will have a conversation. Yeah, that happens, especially in the taxi, because the taxi is an intimate space. Um and especially at night time as well, uh, that does happen. People ask me, because I, I was in the habit in the old days in Abington when I was um driving all night i was in the habit of uh because my father had died uh, at that point and i was uh, i had this battered old bible that i used to carry around on the dashboard it was an ex-london taxi so it, it fitted you know and i carried the bible around because i was looking for 
um, suitable readings for his funeral, and it just was a habit that I got into for mm -hmm. years. And so, and at one point as well, there was this beautiful old uh, elderly Irish lady, Catholic, um, whose faith was completely unshakable, and she gave me a rosary. Rosary, do you call them where you yes, have, um, the beads and the the crosses that you use right, so, for your so hands? I'm, I, I am um, evangelical, Anglican, slightly charismatic, so that's completely an unknown <laughs> to me. But I don't dismiss it. I don't say, you know, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't in any way criticise someone else's faith in that way. But she gave me this rosary, and I used to hang it like some taxi drivers do from the um, from the rearview mirror. And so these are visible signs, right, of mm -hmm. of having a faith. Ooh, yeah. And and so that would lead to questions um, like. Uh, um, you know, someone would say, oh, you don't really believe all that rubbish, do you? And, and I, I'm mostly yes. the answer would be, I do, mate, yeah. Uh, and, you know, you'd get into conversations of all pretty serious things sometimes, actually. Yeah. And sometimes I'd be, yeah. you know, I'd be driving to the John Radcliffe, which is the local hospital, and I'd be picking up people who are, and driving them home, who have just said goodbye to their, yes. you know, yes. their... Their relatives. So and very, very profound discussions. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Completely. Um, and if they if they want that, great. I'm I'm happy to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always happy to do it. But if they want to just sit in silence, then that's fine too. But I never, I'm never the one unless I know the person. I'm never the one to initiate the conversation. Yes. I, I will yes. just, I will just wait for them to sort of say whatever they, whatever they want to and if they don't want to say anything then that's okay too wait, wait um, for the wait for the moment absolutely, absolutely. yeah yeah completely, completely. um great but, uh, yeah well colin it's been lovely talking to you thank you for telling us about your your no du your double life um <laughs> and your cats as well and i'm sure the listeners will be eager to follow you now um yeah. it is at the abingdon taxi on X and uh, yeah thank you again for coming on